Welcome to the Customer Machine Podcast, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston and Yoav Ezer. Glenn is a psychologist and marketer whose companies have sold more than $30 million in consulting and has trained thousands of marketers across different niches and industries. Yoav is a programmer turned marketer whose companies have sold over $5 million in products and services. Together, they'll teach you how to systematically stand out, attract, and convert the best customers, even in brutally competitive markets. And now, here's Glenn and Yoav. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Mr. Yoav, Mr. Machine. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. Looking forward to today's interview. So, what are we talking about today? Well, I wanted to talk about the four ways to corner your market, um, something which I more affectionately call the four quadrants of market research data. And I think this will give people a different perspective on how you get perspective in your market, different ways of doing research and um, rather than being the, I think it was three three blind men and an elephant or five blind men and an elephant, I right. forget exactly how that, yeah, how you can kind of see the whole elephant instead of just being one of the blind men. Good, let's go. But I have to ask you a question first. Shoot. I noticed when you got off the Skype call with me for a second, you talked to your children in English even though you're in Israel. Right, so they actually prefer English now. Really? Um, yeah. And I, t my youngest one, I speak to him in Hebrew and he responds in English. It's, it's unbelievable. That's very interesting. It is. It's, I blame the internet. They watch so much YouTube stuff and it's just, and, and they, they also have the sentence structure of English when they talk in Hebrew. So it comes out funny. And <laughs> when we go to their, um, parent day at school and the teachers tell us that they that they're fluent in English and they're very smart but they don't speak Hebrew as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the if, if I were marketing to children in Israel this is one of the nuances the emerging trends and evolving changes that um, being facile with marketing research and the four quadrants of marketing research data could help me to pick up before other marketers picked it up and resonate more closely with the market. So it's kind of a good example. Good. Okay, let's dive in. Okay. Well, so first of all, I just want to back up and talk about the importance of doing research overall because I, I find so many entrepreneurs, even today, will go in and play what Dan Kennedy calls blind archery. And there, there's just no reason to do that when there's so much information available on the internet, when it's so easy to find consumers to talk to, and why would you want to go out and shoot a target blindfolded when you can just use the internet to put a set of ultra-modern laser-focused guided binoculars on and see exactly what you're shooting at. So I, I know that there's something in human nature that says, I know what I'm doing and I know it, I know it in my soul. I don't need to research this. Um, and we believe that the most personal is the most universal, in other words, if we love it so much, then our prospect will just have to want to buy it. But how many times in your early career, Yoav, did you waste years of your life chasing a, um, chasing a dream where you wanted the market to want what you wanted them to want as opposed to finding out what the market wanted? You know what? I think that that's my biggest regret. I spent years, I, we've talked about this before, but I'll, I'll say it again. It's, it's worth saying. Um, I spent years chasing dreams and products that I thought would be very successful and those years are now gone and if I could do the research if I could go back in time and do the research I would have saved myself years and years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in in, in spending and it's just my biggest regret that I haven't properly done in fact we've we had one project where we did together where we where I didn't do enough research and I think a year and a half of work just went down the drain. So Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think people are reluctant to do enough research because it it brings reality to the fray much quicker and it ends the dream a little bit quicker. You know, most 
most um, businesses are started in a kind of idealist, idealistic dreamers phase, and it's a lot of fun. It's it's intoxicating when you get a new idea. It's intoxicating when you kind of start to talk to people about the air and they, and they seem like they like it and you get a group of friends and founders and investors together. Um, but once you actually start to research the market, inevitably it's going to deflate your bubble in some ways. In other ways, it really excites you and, um, you know, inflates the bubble. But in many ways, it's where the rubber meets the road and it's like putting water in the pipes and you kind of see what's going to hold water and what's not going to hold water. And it, it, it takes away some of the romance of the business, but it also, also can take away an awful lot of the pain and help you to build on a very solid foundation. So, um, yeah, so I always say the biggest mistake in marketing is narcissism, which is wishing your market would want what you want them to want as opposed to finding out what they want and giving it to them. You know, the, the, there was a time where I was kind of active in the Israeli startup scene. I wasn't extremely active, but I've had a lot of friends and some clients in, in, in the startup scene, which is, for people who don't know, it's the second biggest market for technological startup after the Silicon Valley. So it's bigger than New York. It's bigger than London. It's it's really big. Israel is really big in, in technology. And... It got to the point where I would talk to, to inventors, to entrepreneurs, and ask them if they Googled their competitors. If they actually Googled to search for their competitors, and a lot of them would say, no, we haven't, we don't want to poison our idea. Hmm. And, you know, it, it might, it, and it might make sense when you're in that zone you spoke of, where you're enthusiastic and you want to go forward and you want to conquer and you don't want anything to, to deflate your, your uh, enthusiasm, but it's really dangerous. It's really, it, it's really kind dangerous. of like the infatuation stage of a romantic relationship. And yes, you should enjoy that for a little while, but before you get married, you need to know a little more about the person, right? It's like the infatuation stage with the girl where you don't know anything about. You just met her. She's from out of town. And you don't know anything about her. And you don't do any research. It's just crazy. Yeah. So, and the, the flip side of that is that when you do the research, you actually find opportunities that are both exciting and realistic. So... Don't don't be afraid of the research. It's it's crucial, and it can actually help you build a sustainable business, an interesting business that will take you a long way. So, and I I would argue that as the internet evolves, that research is even more essential because the evolution of internet and the information age makes hyper targeting more and more possible. In other words, advertisers are expected to deliver to you much more specifically what you're looking for as opposed to your neighbor. And people, therefore, come to expect, the consumer comes to expect finding exactly what they're looking for um, quicker, more efficiently. And so it becomes incumbent upon the marketer to have both targeted very carefully and research their market exhaustively so that they don't waste the consumer's time in making it clear that they've got exactly what they're looking for. I, I think the perpetrator of this is primarily Google, where they started their whole advertising around keywords, and when it became so easy to find the exact information you need and the exact products you need. So, And that was, what, 10 years ago? Yeah. So... At this point, the consumer, just like you said, the consumer is is not only is not accustomed to the fact that he finds what he needs. It's like the way of life. He's, it's a given. Yeah, it's, it's a, a given. given. Yeah, and even even Facebook, which collects so much information about not only you and your age and income and educational background and 
um, but they collect all this information about your specific interests. They know what groups and forums you you frequent, and they and they sell that to the advertiser. And so the result of that also is that people expect to see advertising, which is very specifically targeted to them. So it's it's really really essential that you learn the basics of marketing research. And, and um, so I'd like to present a very simple paradigm for the different types of marketing research you can do because different people with different personalities gravitate towards one type or another. But if you step back and you look at this two by two matrix I'm going to talk to you about and you, you try to at minimum tap into at least two or three quadrants of the matrix, then you're going to avoid um, a, a researcher's personality bias that I see occurring a lot in in the marketplace and you're going to um, get a different perspective from each quadrant and the overlap is where you're going to find your strongest insights. So the paradigm is that there are two variables. You can listen with your heart or you can listen with your head. You can listen to the market with your heart or you can listen with your head. That's one variable, head versus heart. And the other variable is, do you listen to what people say or do you listen to what they do? And, and that's the other variable, what it's a behavior versus what they say. And you will find, um, you will find educators and gurus that will pontificate about the value of all sides of these issues um, because there are in truth things that you can't get listening with your heart that you can get listening with your head and there are things that you can't get listening to what people do versus listening to what people say and vice versa. So let's let's talk a little more specifically about each one. L listening with your heart means that you're talking to people in an open-ended way and trying to forge a connection with them so you can follow their lines of thinking wherever those lines of thinking might take you. And you don't have to follow a structured questionnaire or um, you know, detailed survey in order to do it. And this type of an open-ended heart-to-heart interview really is excellent for getting at what's driving them emotionally to making the purchase decisions that they're make, making what's the relationship that they're looking for with the product or brand because people tend to forge relationships with their products or brands what does the purchase really mean to them on the deepest level what does it do for them in their not in their life what human needs does it serve what does it say about them to have bought this particular type of atom or this particular brand and how does it further their lives as as you know emotional relationship oriented human beings. Those are the kinds of things that you get by listening to your with your heart. On the other hand, listening with your heart, uh, because it's so unstructured, soulful and artistic, it tends not to be as statistically reliable and projectable. And so it's very easy to get and it's and it's very easy to kind of fall in love with the prospect, which you want to do, but by the same token, you don't want to do it, do it at the expense of the more quantitative questions that marketers need to ask, like how big is the opportunity? How competitive is the market? Where are the soft spots and market gaps, statistically speaking, in the market? What are the characteristics of the purchase? What are the actual desired attributes of the product? You know, how do those attributes rank in terms of preference, um, what percentage of, you know, men versus women versus older versus younger people are interested in purchase. Um, what, 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 you get, what you get from listening with your head in that kind of a structured way is more of an x-ray. And you can think of, you think of listening with your head as giving you the real structure and skeletal bones of the market and listening with your heart as giving you the um, you know, the, the flesh and the skin and the real substance to bring it to life. Everything makes sense so far, Yoav? It does, but I'm, I'm going to have to get an example of this because 
So what does, let's say, can you give an example of how this works with a specific product or a service? Well, okay, give me a product or service. Um, let's say I'm, I want to open a t-shirt line. Okay. So if I were going to listen to my head about a t-shirt line, I might set up a survey or look at previous surveys that have been done to find out what's the incidence of online t-shirt purchasing in the United States, right? And so I might use Google Consumer Surveys or I might look at marketresearch.com and I want to know what the incidence of purchase was and I'd want to know um, what the average age and gender was for the most you know, hyper responsive buyers. And mm -hmm. I, I'd be interested in, um, you know, the brands that had what percent of market share and, um, you know, and, and all of those types of things. Who, who were the major competitors? Um, so you'd what, run a survey with a question like, um, when was the last time you bought a t shirt? What brand was it? Um, et cetera. Yes. So that's listening with your head, right? And you get the segments, you know which one is more responsive and what brands they, they like the most. So a survey is one method of listening with your head, yes. Okay. That's true. Now, if I wanted to listen with my heart, I would recruit people who were heavy T-shirt purchasers. And af I probably would do this after having done the survey so I'd get a sense of how to comprise the sample of people I wanted to talk to. So if I found out that, you know, t-shirt, frequent t-shirt purchasers tended to be, you know, like 70% men in their 20s um, or their wives, then I would comprise a sample that would, that would approximate what I found out in the survey. And then I would recruit from that sample and ask people if I could talk to them for 20 minutes about um, how do they choose a t-shirt? You know, what, what are the last few t-shirts that they purchased and could they, could they send me a picture of them and um, why, did they bu why did they buy that shirt? You know, mm -hmm. what, what was it that spoke to them about that shirt and how do they feel when they're wearing that shirt? And, um, you know, is there ever, has there ever been a t-shirt that they bought that they just didn't even want to wash because they didn't want to take it off? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd be looking for really emotional stories and, you know, how they first got into t-shirts and you know, nice. remember wearing t-shirts when they were kids, those kind of things. Awesome. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Well, then the other variable is listening to what people say versus what they do. So um, when you're listening to people, what people say, that's when we're doing a market survey, right? Because we're asking them, asking them for their best recollection about the last time they bought, they bought a t-shirt or their best um, recollection about the favorite shirt they ever had and what stories they can tell us about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's listening to what people say. On the other hand, there are problems with taking people's self-reports because as any marketer knows, there's usually a discrepancy between what people say and what they do, particularly if you ask them about price, um, there's often a discrepancy between what they say and what they do. But also, people like to think of themselves as rational beings, and there's something we call rational purchasing consciousness, which means that they're embarrassed to admit that they make emotional decisions. Um, they're not necessarily always smart shoppers. And so there's often a big discrepancy between what they say and what they do. And for that reason, we definitely want to include as part of our research an observation of how they actually behave. So online, that might be something like split testing two different versions of a sales letter and seeing which one they actually purchase more frequently from. Mm. Um, it might be running some type of multivariate test. Um, it, it, it might be, um, it might also be, um, you know, doing some type of field research or observation where you actually go watch people shop and buy. You, um, I remember we did a big study for Lipton where we needed to figure out what people did with leaky tea bags, and we didn't really trust their, we didn't really trust their report because it wasn't 
the world's biggest problem, but it was definitely a problem. And we decided the best way to do it was to actually send researchers out into their homes to observe what they did and take notes. Um, so field research and observation is a form of listening to what people do. Wait, wait but what, what did they do? I don't remember. We have to ask Sharon. <laughs> my, my, it was my wife's study. It was my wife's study. She, I, I have a cousin that uh -huh. saves the tea bags. If you go to his house, uh -huh. if you do perform research in his house, on his tap, with the water tap, you'll see dozens of old uh, tea bags and he just reuses them all the time. Mm -hmm. I never drink tea there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's scary. But hey, hey he's probably saved some money, right? Right. That's funny. So when you put these two things together, listening with your head, listening with your heart, listening to what people say, listening to what they do, you could draw a quadrant. And it, you know, I think you're you could draw four quadrants, and I think it would be good if you to put a picture of this in the uh, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that any method that you come up with for evaluating the market will fall into one of those four quadrants. So listening with your head to what people say, those are market surveys, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got a structured questionnaire, you can quantify the results. Um, but it's what people say. It's their self-reports. Listening with your heart to what people say are interviews, focus groups, forums and bulletin boards, putting live chat on your site. That's listening with your heart to what people say. Listening with your head to what people do are things like split testing, multivariate testing, things that you can really quantify the observations, whereas listening with your heart to what people do or more of the ethnographic interviewing, that's where we send people to see what you're doing with your tea bags at, at home. Yeah. To actually watch you out in the field. And so why is it valuable to know this? It's valuable to know this because to get a full perspective, you would ideally like to tap each of the four quadrants because everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. But if you, and maybe we can go over the strengths and weaknesses of each, each of each of the quadrants if you want. But if you only rely on one, and most marketers tend to just rely on one, then you're likely missing a key insight into the market. Right? So, so market surveys will tell you the size and opportunity of the market. And it'll get you really good language to use in sales copy, but it market survey doesn't really get at the soul of what makes people buy. It doesn't, right. it doesn't tell you what they smell like. I'm sorry, I, I'll shut up for a second if you want to say something. No, no, I totally agree. Go on. Okay. And like we were talking about before, there's always a discrepancy between what people say and what they do. Focus groups, interviews, and live chat, while they, get, while they do get at the soul of the market, they also make it way too easy to get lost in conversation and convince yourself that the market wants what you want them to want, which is marketing narcissism, like we talked about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Testing and tracking in that quadrant, it's going to tell you what the market is doing. They don't necessarily tell you why they're doing it. And people that rely strictly on split testing are often at a loss for knowing what the next move might be. Right. They know that, yeah. So you need the other kinds of, of research to know what to test. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And field research and observation gets you a real gut level of what's happening in the market, but it it lacks the detailed linguistic entrenchment and quantification of the head-based methods. So you're not you're not going to get the whole perspective unless you tap each of the quadrants. And on a practical basis, you know, just make sure you do at least two. I ideally like you to do all four if you've got a project that's exceptionally important to you, but make sure you do at least two in every market that you're in, so. So I've got the question for you here. Okay. Um, this generation, we started talking about my kids, but the current generation and the ones following are completely different than, than our generation in, in that, that they continuously document themselves online. Mm-hmm. You've got a stream of consciousness going through their Twitter feed, and then there's Snapchat where they, 
you know, some kids put up, not even kids, even adults, they put up 20, 50, 70 Snapchats a day. And you get 10 second videos, windows into their lives. How, how would you use the, in what quadrant does that fall? That kind of information. Okay. So like if, and it, it's valuable information, by the way. So if you were to look in Facebook interest groups or forums or look at a Twitter feed on a particular keyword, there's, it's, it's almost like, um, it's almost like field research and observation. It's almost like you could go to a trade conference without having to go to the conference. So for example, I study binge eating. I wrote a book, Never Binge Again, on, on binge eating. And I don't necessarily have to go to a binge eating seminar or workshop to see how you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 people who suffer from binge eating talk to one another. I could look at any of the binge eating groups on Facebook. I could go to search.twitter.com and type in binge eating and look at all the Twitter feeds of people who are talking about binge eating. I could see the advertisers that are talking about binge eating. Um, you know, I, I, I could search it out on Pinterest. I could look at Instagram. So it's almost like there are all of these niched trade conferences going on, which are being recorded. That's different from what actually happens at a trade conference, but now they're actually being recorded. And the data is just out there for you to go and immerse yourself in um, when you want to. And it's, it's really a type of qualitative listening, listening with your heart to what people are saying what they're, what, and what they're doing, depending upon the, the group that you'd look at. So um, it's a kind of ethnographic observation is really mm -hmm. what I say. Yeah. Okay. And another thing, when I started doing market research, I gravitated towards listening with my head. I've got a background in programming, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they're very logical types, and they they gravitate towards the surveys. But having worked with you and with, with Sharon, I learned that the value of listening with your heart, of talking to people, asking open-ended questions, letting them tell you what, what they feel, what they experience is extremely valuable. It's, it's, and it's not as difficult as I thought preliminary. So you should give it a chance. I have to tell you, you know, I've coached um, well over a hundred entrepreneurs directly. I, I mean, I've had tens of thousands of people that follow my work and buy my products and stuff, but well over a hundred entrepreneurs that I've coached personally and directly, and not one of them have I failed to recommend get on the phone with their client at some point. And it's, it's hard to get people to do. It's hard to, to get people to actually get on the phone and do a little telephone survey with their clients. Right. And, and, but there is nobody who did it who ever thought it was a waste of time. There, there's nobody who got mad at me for making them do it. I always get tremendous accolades for, for pushing people to do that. So if you're listening and you're willing to overcome your shyness or desire to sit behind the computer screen and figure this all out and actually get on the phone and talk to people, um, you, you won't look back. I'm sure you won't look back. And I keep, I keep saying that over and over again, but it's important. So I'll tie it back in into getting investment and funding. When you sit with a VC or an angel investor and you start saying, and we talked to 20 customers on the phone. We had a 30 minute conversation with each customer and these are the results of those conversations, you can see the investor shift to the edge of the seat and start listening with intent. Because in, you know, in 99% of, of cases, you'll be the only one that did that. And the investors really want to know what the customer wants. They're not, they're not really interested in your opinion, but when you start talking about the customers, they listen. So, Apart from giving you real insight into your own marketing, 
it also gives you an edge when you when you try to you try to raise funds procure sure. procure investments yeah sure sure we've actually been hired for that purpose before so i i understand okay well okay my friend is that it for today i think so are we done with this i think we're done with it my friend good good thank you glenn Thanks for your time and attention. For more information about the products and services we offer to help dramatically grow your business, please visit thecustomermachine.com. On behalf of Glenn and Yoav, thanks for listening.